Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity for us to be able to come together and to study your word once more. Dear Father, I pray that you would please be with our hearts and our minds as we seek to become properly abreast regarding the nature and the practice of medical missionary work. Dear Lord, I pray they be with our understanding. I pray they be with our online audience that they may be blessed as well and those that may watch this in the future. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in light of that, let us open up our Bibles to the book. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Hosea. We're going to read in, in uh, chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Let's notice what the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4. We saw this principle yesterday in Proverbs chapter 19 in verse number 2. So Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse number 6. Now this may be a Bible text that is very familiar to us, but notice what God says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of what? For a lack of knowledge. It says, because thou hast done what to that knowledge? Because thou hast rejected it. So in reality, especially when we talk about the laws of health, the destruction of us as human beings is not merely because of our ignorance, but it is because there has been an intentional rejection of the principles that pertain to our prosperity. Does that make sense? Now, as we talk about keeping the, the body in proper health, what is the number one law of health? What, what do you think is the number one law of health? Okay, somebody says trust in divine power. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of, of uh, Proverbs. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs. We're going to read in the third chapter, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And again, I'm pretty sure that these Bible texts are somewhat familiar to us. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to read in verse number 5. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with some of thine heart, with all of thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall do what unto thy paths? Direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It says, it shall be health to thy what? So you see how, so you see here, how God is making a complete and direct parallel between our spiritual and our physical health. So God is saying is that if we trust in him with all of our heart, as we read in verse number eight, it says, it shall be held to thy uh, navel and marrow to thy what? And marrow to thy bones. Now in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn our Bibles to the New Testament. And let's turn to 3 John in verse 2. Let's turn to 3 John in verse 2. Let's turn to 3 John. 3 John, it only has one chapter. We're going to read in verse number 2. 3 John in verse number 2. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul doeth what? So again, God makes it very clear that there is a direct correlation between our spiritual and our physical health. Now, in light of that, as we take a look uh, back at our screen, now, does everybody remember this? Now, this picture, what is this picture seeking to, seeking to depict? Yes, this is seeking to depict a heart attack. Now, are there very many things that can contribute to a heart attack? Yes. Now, we're actually going to find out that one of the great reasons why people are suffering from heart attacks and strokes and heart disease and all of these things is not merely because they're smoking cigarettes. It's not merely because they're eating McDonald's every day. It's not merely because they're chronically consuming alcohol. It's because of another factor. Again, this is a symbol of suffering humanity. It says... Sickness, suffering, and death are the work of an antagonistic power. Satan is the destroyer, but God is 
the restore. Again, the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States. We have heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory diseases. It says, the only hope of better things is the education of the people in right what? In right principles. Now, does anybody know what that word education means? Does anybody know what that word education means? Yes, it means character development. So the prophet is actually bringing out the correlation that if we're going to have right character development, we need to learn how to take care of our bodies. Now, unfortunately, even amongst us as Seventh-day Adventists, there is this notion that what we eat and how we take care of our bodies, that this is not salvific. Has anybody ever heard of that before? That how you take care of your body has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. Now, the people who say this are not necessarily evil persons. They just don't understand the nature of anatomy and physiology. Because this is the principle. When we eat food, that food that goes into our mouths and goes into our stomach through the uh, large and small intestine, what actually happens is that that food is broken down and actually turns into the blood that courses through our veins. Our blood then takes the nutrients from that food and actually furnishes nutriment to all of our vital organs, including our brain. Now, what is housed in our brain? The mind. And the mind is the mechanism by which we communicate with God. So the things that we eat have a direct correlation on our ability to be able to commune with God. Now, does that make sense? Yeah. Notice. This says, in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions change, wrong habits corrected, then nature is to be assisted. It says, pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. The principles involved in the treatment of the sick and, how, and to have a practical training that will enable one rightly to use this Knowledge. Now, does everybody see this? Now, this is a picture of what organ of our bodies? Yes, this is a symbol of the brain, as we just read in Proverbs chapter 3, that God is admonishing us to trust in him with all of our heart. Now, is this uh, actually talking about the physical heart that is uh, contained within our ribcage? No, this is just another, um, as it were, metaphor for the mind, for the mind. All right, this is taken from volume five of the testimonies, page 443. This says, Satan is the originator of what? Satan is the originator of disease. So if Satan is the originator of disease, does God arbitrarily bring disease upon any person? No, God permits things to happen, but Satan is the originator of disease. It says, and the physician is warring against his work and power. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. So if we're going to properly combat disease and Satan is the originator of disease, what type of power do you think that we need to have in order to contend with Satan? Now, can we fight Satan in our own power? Now, how long has Satan been alive? Satan has been alive for a very long time. Now, even though this earth has been here roughly about 6,000 years, we have no understanding as to how long Satan was in heaven when he was still Lucifer. Lucifer could have been in heaven for millions of years before he revolted against God. Satan has been alive for a very, very long time. So in light of that, and also in light of his grand intelligence, do you think that we stand any chance in contending with Satan in our own power? We have no chance. We literally need to be linked up with Christ. This says nine tenths of diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Now, when that says here, what is that referring to? All right, let's read it again. It says sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. And then it says, nine-tenths of diseases from which men suffer have their foundation where? Here, in the mind. So one of the greatest reasons why men and women are suffering from physical disease, whether it be cancer, diabetes, hypertension, 
ALS, all of these things is because their minds are diseased. Now, nine tenths is what percentage? 90%. So don't get me wrong. There's a place to study nutrition and, uh, and, and, and getting fresh air and exercise and all of these things. But the greatest area that needs the most attention is the mind, is the mind. It says perhaps some living home trouble is like a canker eating to the very soul and weakening the life forces. Remorse for sin sometimes undermines the constitution and does what to the mind? It unbalances the mind. Now, when Adam and Eve were first created, did they have any imbalance of mind? No, they didn't. It says there are erroneous doctrines also as that of an eternally burning hell and the endless torment of the wicked. So is it also possible that false doctrines can lead to the perversion of the imagination? Yes. So is it also important to have right, proper teaching and doctrine from the Bible? Yes, it is. It says that by giving exaggerated and distorted views of the character of God have produced the same result upon sensitive minds. This says the religion of Christ, so far from being the cause of insanity, is one of its most effectual remedies. For it is a potent soother of the what? It is a soother of the nerves. So as we uh, understand the religion of Christ and are able to communicate this to other persons, it will help to alleviate the perplexities that they have in their imagination. Now, in order for us to be able to properly communicate this, do you think that we ourselves need to understand the gospel? Yes, we do. And we need to be able to experience it ourselves. All right, now when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? What comes to your imagination? It is a symbol of a broken heart. It is often said that there is a God-sized hole in every person that does not properly know him. Now, is that a true statement? That is a very true statement. Without Christ properly abiding in the soul, that there is a massive hole that is in our minds. And this massive hole cannot be remedied without the presence of of Christ, without the presence of Christ. Now, in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. And let's notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And let's notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse number 5. It says, why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is what? Now, again, when the Bible is uh, referring to a heart, what is, what is it actually uh, seeking to uh, bring light to? The mind, yes. In verse 6, it says, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been clothed, neither closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. So naturally, apart from Christ, what is the nature uh, and the constitution of our minds? Yes, the Bible says that there is no soundness in it. And unfortunately, Satan tries to leave this illusion and impression, especially upon our minds as Christians, that those who are serving Satan have peace and happiness. We see the celebrities and the sportsmen on social media. We see all of these persons that are openly doing very nefarious things. And because of the optic, it gives the illusion that they're happy and prosperous. But are they truly happy and prosperous? No, they're not. Now, in light of that, let's turn uh, to chapter 57 of the same book, Isaiah. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 57. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 57. We're going to read in verse number 20. Isaiah chapter 57 in verse number 20. The Bible says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Notice verse 21. There is no peace, saith my God, to the what? 
So the Bible is making it very clear that there is absolutely no peace to the wicked. No peace. So even by default, as we go and seek to practice medical missionary work, those who are apart from Christ, we can know from the, our very first interactions that they have no peace. Now, is it just persons in the world that don't have any peace? Is it also persons in the church? Notice, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. You see, because it is very easy for us as Christians, yea, as Seventh-day Adventists, to become very sanctimonious and say that it is only those that are in the world that don't have peace. But notice what the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in verse number 16. The Bible says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Now, when the Bible is referring to this, he, uh, who is this speaking of? Christ. Yes, this is speaking of Christ. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah or the, or the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Notice what Christ quoted in the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel unto the what? To the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance unto the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them, uh, them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened where? Now, why were they fastened upon Christ? Why were their eyes fastened upon Jesus? You see, because they understood that this prophecy was in direct correlation to the Messiah. So they were processing and reasoning in their minds that this man may very well be the Messiah. But notice what the Bible goes on to say. In verse 21, and it says, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in where? In your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? But notice, uh, jumping down to verse number 26. But it says, um, we're going to read in verse 27. It says, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias or uh, Elisha, the prophet. And none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with great happiness and jubilation. They were filled. Now, why were they filled with wrath when Jesus said these words? It's because they realized that Jesus was actually saying that they were the ones that were in bondage, that it wasn't the Canaanites, it wasn't the Romans, it was they themselves. And when Jesus said very definitively that they were in bondage, they were filled with, with not righteous indignation, but they were filled with satanic wrath and vehemence. Now, as a result of them feeling these satanic emotions, what did they want to do to Jesus? The Bible actually says that they physically took the man and went to go throw him off the brow of a cliff. As we seek to do this medical missionary work, before we seek to give the gospel to those out in the world, we must first receive its principles into our own hearts. Into our own hearts. Now, does anybody know who this woman was? Anybody know who this woman was? This is actually a young woman by the name of Alarna Miller. Notice this. Louisiana College mourns Alarna Miller who puts suicide note on Instagram. Unfortunately, this dear young woman, she committed suicide. Now let's notice why she committed suicide. Now this was actually a copy of her suicide note. Notice this. She said, I've lost my connection to God. The devil seems to have won. And that is okay. Now, is it okay that the devil won in her situation? No, it's not. I blame no one for this. I thank everyone for all they've done, and I'm sorry. I'm so 
So sorry. And it's so sad, especially for us as young people, because Satan deceives us into believing that we can listen to rap music all day, that we can smoke weed all day, that we can fornicate all day, that we can do all of these things that pertain to Satan and that this will have absolutely no effect upon our mental health. This is deception. Brothers and sisters, Christ has come to set the captives free. Now, does anybody know who this woman was? Mother of Miss USA, Chelsea Chris, reveals pageant queen had attempted suicide before. Unfortunately, this woman was Miss USA, and even though she had all of the fame, she had the physical beauty, but she was very empty in her soul, and as a result of that, she killed herself. Does anybody know who this woman was? Stanford University star soccer player died by suicide, parents tell NBC. Again, unfortunately, this dear young woman was going to one of the most prestigious universities, literally in, in the entire world at Stanford, but because of the pressure she was experiencing, she took her own life. Anybody know who this woman was? Again. Medical examiner James, uh, James Madison University softball player Lauren Burnett died by suicide again. As a result of this young woman feeling all of the pressure that she was experiencing, she took her own life. Do we see a trend? Yes. Again, does anybody know who this was? University of Wisconsin track star Sarah Schultz dies at 57. Is that what it says? These are young People. Unfortunately, because of the pressure she was experiencing, she took her own life. Skipping past. Anybody know who this was? A rapper, a young woman who called herself Lil Bo Weep, singer and YouTube star, dead at 22 again. Now, and this is not as a means to degrade the memory of this dear sister, but just taking a look at how she present, was presenting herself, do you think that Satan was actively tormenting her? Yes, he was. And this, again, is not as a means to cast a shadow upon her memory. But when someone is covering themselves in tattoos, this is actually an evidence of the demons that are controlling the imagination. This is why God said very definitively in the book of Deuteronomy that God, that the children of Israel were not to practice these abominations. Again, a dear young man, as a result of the pressure he was experiencing, this man played Arnold Schwarzenegger in a docu-series. Bodybuilder Mr. Universe Callum Von Magra hospitalized after jumping from window. Now, this dear young man actually was not able to follow through with the suicide. He jumped out of a window, and now I believe he's paralyzed from the waist down. Again, this was a child star. Former child actor Matthew Milder's cause of death at 19 revealed as sodium nitrate toxicity. Lonely, burnt out, and depressed, the state of millennials' mental health in 2020. Do you know, and again, this is not as a means to, you know, encourage gloom and doom, but sadly, people are taking their lives at extraordinary rates. Extraordinary rates, men and women are taking their own lives. Again, this is a symbol of the mind. Notice what this says from the book, Desire of Ages. He who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to do what again? To thirst again. Everywhere men and women are... And again, Satan may try to have us believe that all of the worldly people are enjoying all of their millions and billions of dollars that they're going on their yachts practicing sexual immorality and all of these things and making us believe that they have peace. But God is declaring that they are unsatisfied. And they're trying to fill it with money. They're trying to fill it with fame. And even those of us do not, who, who do not have access to these riches, we're trying to sedate our spiritual consciousness with these false and artificial things. It says they long for something to supply the need of the soul. Only one can meet that want. The need of the world, the desire of all nations is what? Is Christ. The desire of all nations is Jesus Christ. 
Buddha is not going to fill it. Muhammad is not going to fill it. Krishna is not going to fill it. And this is not as an arbitrary indictment upon those that follow these religions, but it is only Christ that can properly fill the needs of the soul. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 11. And as you turn there, you see, dear friends, what we have to understand is that especially as we seek to do medical missionary work, we have to understand that this is the greatest, that this is the area that needs the greatest amount of attention. Because many people would recover health if they were just properly connected to heaven. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read in verse number 28. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy what? Laden, and I will give you rest. Now, when Jesus is saying, All ye that labor and are heavy laden, now what labor is Jesus referring to? Yes, the labor of sin. Jesus made it very clearly and, and um, stated very clearly. Um, through the Apostle Paul in Romans, that the wages of sin is, is death. So we literally have to work for sin in order to gain death. But notice, in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of... Now, what is a yoke for? What is a yoke for? It is for labor. It is for work. So Christ is saying, shun the work and labor of Satan and take up my work. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your want. So Christ is actually saying that the solution to your mental and spiritual perplexities is actually in engaging in service for me. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We're going to read in chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to read in verse number six. The Bible says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every want. Yes, the yoke of sin. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Now, is that a very practical work for us to do as Christians? Very practical. And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to the Salvation Army. Is that what it says? That are cast out to thine own house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth what? So Christ is actually saying a remedy for the diseased nature of your mind and heart is actually engaging in service for your fellow man. Does that make sense? Now, in light of that, let's turn our Bibles back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. Let's read that last verse, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read in verse number 30. Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is what? You see, it is so satanic how Satan tries to leave this illusion that working for God is hard. But the Bible makes it very clear that the, that, the, um, that the way of transgression, that the way of the transgressor, that that is actually hard. It's not the way of righteousness. Because again, the wages of sin is not glory and eternal life, but the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now in light of that, everybody see this. Now, this is a mind that is growing out of the ground. This is uh, simply a symbol, a metaphor. Now, what is watering this mind? Everybody see that? And that container is housing what? It's housing water. Now, what is likened unto water in a spiritual context? 
In a spiritual context, what is likened unto water? Let's read in John chapter 4. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John chapter 4. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of John chapter 4, and let's notice what the Bible says. Does everybody remember the experience of the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman? John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse number 13. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting what? Into everlasting life. So this water is likened unto everlasting life, and everlasting life is merely Christ. It's simply Christ. So the water in a spiritual context that is, that is going to give our minds the refreshment that it needs has its foundation in Jesus Christ. And again, especially as we go to seek to do this medical missionary work, this is what must be emphasized upon the minds and hearts of those with whom we associate. Because there are many persons, again, who would recover from their diseases, that would be recovering from their cancers and diabetes and all of these things simply if they were in a right relation to heaven. This says again, the work of the true medical missionary is largely a work of hydrotherapy. Is that what it says? It is largely a spiritual work. Now, just to get uh, some context, what percentage did we find out before um, uh, as far as the nature of disease? What is the, the primary reason why people are diseased as far as percentage, as it pertains to the mind? 90%. Yes, 90%. So when this says largely a spiritual work, we can roughly estimate that it is around 90% a spiritual work. It says it includes prayer and the laying on of hands. He therefore should be sacredly set apart for his work as is the minister of the want. Now, generally, when we think about doing health work, do we really think about it that seriously? You see, this is why it's so important, if, it, if at all possible, for us to have Christian doctors. Because by God's grace, a Christian physician will understand the great solemnity of the work that he is performing. It says, those who are selected to act a part of the uh, missionary physicians are to be set apart as such. This will strengthen them against the temptations, notice, to withdraw from the sanitarium work to engage in private practice. Now, unfortunately, a vast majority of even 70 Adventist physicians are going against this counsel. Now, in light of what we read in Hosea chapter 4, what is the, one of the great reasons why this counsel is not being followed? Is because of a lack of knowledge. Now, this is a question. Why have we been reading so much of the spirit of prophecy in this medical missionary training? Why have we been reading so much of, this, of the spirit of prophecy in the medical missionary, in this medical missionary training? Let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles very quickly. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in the context of chapter 10, it's actually referring to the experience of the ancient Hebrews as they were coming out of Egypt and traveling during that 40 years excursion in the wilderness onto Canaan. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, the Bible says, Now all these things happen unto them for what? For in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are what? Now, anciently and typically, did God raise up a prophet in order to give instruction to God's people in order to lead them into the physical Canaan? Has in this generation God given a prophet to give instruction to his people as we seek to enter into the heavenly Canaan? You know, it's so amazing when you go and read uh, during the experience of the kings. There was a king named Josiah. Anybody ever heard of Josiah? Now, was Josiah a righteous or a wicked king? 
He was a righteous king. Now, Josiah was engaging in a process of revival and reformation. Now, as he was engaging in this process, he actually sent Shaphan the scribe into the temple and Shaphan found something called the book of the law. Now, the book of the law was simply Genesis to Deuteronomy that was giving the instruction that the children of Israel were to follow if they were going to be prosperous. Now, had Israel gotten to the point where they were following that instruction? No, they weren't. As Josiah started to read the book of the law, he actually realized that Israel was under a curse because of the lifestyle and the practices that they were performing. Now, how did Josiah react and respond when he read the book of the law? The Bible says that he rent his garments. You see, in this generation, anti-typically, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we unfortunately have greatly deviated from the instruction that God has given unto us. We as a people have almost no sanitariums as a denomination. We as Seventh-day Adventists have almost no institutions that are properly practicing the principles of true education. And this is why there is such a great need of revival and reformation. You see, because one of the things that we really have to understand by the grace of God, and this is really all of us, God means exactly what he says, exactly what he says. And one of the things that we see very clearly in the scriptures that God can only bless the things that are according to his plans. Now, when the early rain fell upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost, what did those apostles have to do in order to meet the conditions to receive the latter to receive the early rain? They had to confess. They had to come together in unity. They had to come into right relation to heaven. Now, if we want our medical missionary work to be successful, do you think that we have to follow God's principles? We do because God is not going to bless mess. We are too far along in the great controversy for us to just be halfway following the dictates of heaven. This says no selfish motives should be allowed to draw the worker from his post of duty. The medical uh, work done in connection with the giving of the third angel's message is to accomplish wonderful results. It is to be a sanctifying, unifying work corresponding to the work which the great head of the church sent forth in uh, the first disciples to do. This says for thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the human mind and he has learned to know it what? Again, are we any match for Satan? We are no match for Satan. By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own and imbuing it with his thoughts. Isn't that such a scary thought that we can get so linked up with Satan that we can actually be thinking his thoughts, believing it's our own sentiments? Lord have mercy. And he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by him at his will. The great deceiver hopes so to confuse the minds of men and women that none but his voice will be what? Will be heard. Now, what is the number one thing that Jesus warned against in the last days in Matthew 24? Deception. deception. Brothers and sisters, there is a myriad of deception here in these last days. And the only mechanism that God has given to us in order to not be deceived by Satan is the word of God. This is why the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Now, what does light do to darkness? It dispels it. So if we want the darkness around us to be dispelled, we have to take heed to the word of God. And again, as we're doing medical missionary work, as we're communicating to individuals, they need to understand that if the darkness surrounding their conscience is going to be dispelled, they have to come to Jesus Christ. Now, the only way that they're going to come to Christ is if they see Christ abiding in us. All right. Now, does everybody see this? Now, this is a symbol of what? What is that a symbol of? 
Now, you usually have that symbol on your cell phone, and that is supposed to designate what in the cell phone? Yes, restarting the cell phone. Restarting the cell phone. This is a symbol of the renewing of our minds that needs to take place. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. We're going to read in chapter 12 as we seek to bring this message to a close. Romans chapter 12, we're going to read in verse number 1. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your unreasonable service. Is that what it says? You see, serving God is the only reasonable thing to do. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of what? You see, what Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 is actually delineating is the process of conversion. You see, because conversion is not merely a change in our feelings. It's not merely an effervescence of spirituality. It's a complete change of our minds, how we think, how we relate to sin and unrighteousness, our desire to serve God with all of our entire heart, mind, soul, and strength. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice how the Bible describes this process of conversion. It says, it, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are, be, are become new. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Galatians. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to read in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse number 19. Notice what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 in verse number 19. The Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of what? You see, so when we are unconverted, we are freely indulging in these lusts of the flesh. Does that make sense? But notice in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, notice, have crucified the flesh with the affections and loves. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the what? Walk in the Spirit. So when we pass from death unto life, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. Now, even when we're converted, does that mean that we're not going to feel the pleadings and tuggings of sin? Now, we're still going to feel those tuggings, but because we're converted by the grace of God, we will fight against those natural inclinations. Does that make sense? Because the unconverted person will indulge them. And this is very important to understand. Temptation is not sin. The indulgence is sin, but not merely the temptation. So again, as we're talking about the renewing of the mind, as we're talking about medical missionary work and leading people into a connection with heaven, we must be able to spell out in very clear detail how they can surrender their hearts to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Now, do we as Seventh-day Adventists, have we been given any book that clearly shows us how to surrender the heart to Christ? Now, is Steps to Christ a very uh, lengthy dissertation on how to, uh, how to repent and turn to Christ? 
Steps to Christ is a very, very tiny book. It's only 13 chapters. Do you think that that little book helps to spell out very clearly how to surrender the soul to Christ? Do we have to go and do penance in order to surrender our souls to Christ? Does a person have to, to travel to Mecca or Jerusalem in order to surrender their hearts to Christ? You see, one of the things by the grace of God that we need to pray that the Lord will help us to do is to explain the process of conversion very simply. You see, because unfortunately, Satan always is trying to complicate the work of salvation. But surrendering to Christ is a very simple process. Very simple. The ministry of healing, as we close. It says, for those who would regain or preserve hell, there is a lesson in the words of Scripture. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the what? The Spirit, yes. Not through the excitement of or oblivion produced by unnatural or unhealthful stimulants, not through indulgence of the lower appetites or passions, is to be found true healing or refreshment for the body or the soul. Among the sick are many who are without God and without hope. They suffer from ungratified desires, distorted passions. At the bottom, those who drink at the fountain of selfish pleasure are deceived. They mistake hilarity for what? For strength. And when the excitement ceases, they, their inspiration ends, and they are left to discontent and despondency. This says, abiding peace through rest of spirit has but one source. It was of this that Christ spoke when he said, Come unto me, all that ye that labor and are heavy laden. We just read that. It is in Christ, and we can receive it only by receiving him. When the sunlight of God's love illuminates the darkened chambers of the soul, restless weariness and dissatisfaction will do what? It will cease. Lastly, there is a science of Christianity to be what? Now, when the prophet says science, what does that word science mean? Yes, the study of or the principles that pertain to a particular subject. So this is saying that there, is, that there are principles or the study of Christianity that has to be mastered. A science as much deeper, broader, higher than any human science as the, high, as the heavens are higher than the earth. The mind is to be what? You see, one of the very great reasons why we are so oppressed by the enemy is because our minds are not disciplined. We tend to be very scatterbrained. Now, was Jesus' mind, was it very disciplined? <laughs> His mind was very disciplined, and this is one of the great reasons why he never gave in, not even to mental temptation. Discipline, educated, trained, for we are to do service for God in ways that are not in harmony with inborn what? You see, because persons have to realize that the work of salvation is one of cooperation. Now, can we save ourselves as human beings? But is God going to save us if we don't cooperate with him? Now, does everybody remember the ancient ritual service of the ancient Hebrews? Now, in order symbolically for the sins of the repentant Israelite to go into the sanctuary, did the priest bring the lamb to the sanctuary? No. no, the repentant sinner had to bring the sacrifice to the sanctuary and they had to slit the throat of that precious little lamb. And then it was the work of the high priest to then take that blood into the sanctuary in order to intercede for the repentant sinner. You see, the ritual service taught very clearly this great work of cooperation. It says, there are hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil that must be overcome. Because this is just a question. As we're talking about, you know, health reform and medical missionary work, as we start to realize that things like pork and things like processed meats and all of these things are bad for the body, is God going to go into someone's fridge and take out the pork chops and the beefsteak? Is an angel from heaven going to go into the fridge and take out the malt liquor? What has to happen in order for that malt liquor to go into the trash? The individual has to make the decision to get rid of the malt liquor. But literally as they decide to serve Christ, 
the Lord will actually imbue them with his Holy Spirit to go into the fridge and take out the malt liquor. This is the work of cooperation. This says we are to form habits of thought that will enable us to resist temptation. Every act, every word, every thought is to be in accord with these principles. And again, the appeal is just very simple. Who here by show of hands says that I want this renewed mind? I want this, transf this transformed heart and association because especially in light of us going out to win the world, we must first experience this for ourselves. Without further ado, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for these principles of health and temperance. We thank you so much for the power of a renewed mind that you are so freely seeking to give to us. Holy Father, I pray in a very special way that you would please forgive us of our sins and that you would cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Whatever we may have done so as to disease our imagination, to bring Satan's strongholds upon us, dear Lord, we just pray that you would break the power of the enemy. And I just pray, dear Father, that you would please be with this precious community that surrounds us. Many souls are perishing in ignorance of these principles that would bring them life, healing, and restoration. And I just pray that you would prepare them for the entrance of the gospel into their own experience. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.